enjoyed uh, Terry's prayer during praise and worship that he's our legal king. See, God's a legalist. <laughs> well, you know, it's really uh, ridiculous because that's a term, legalism is a term that's not even in Scripture. You know, it uses lawful or lawlessness. And so I've always said, you know, that I never really liked that term, legalism, because it, it creates in people's minds that there's not a legal way of doing things. And there is. And uh, so when she prayed, you're our legal king. You did it the right way. See, that's legalism. That's what real legalism is. I understand the church uses it for a different terminology, and I, I don't want to get into a striving about words, but, you know, uh, I'm always trying to be aware of things that can rob us, you know, philosophies or, you know, concepts, human wisdom that can rob us of the things of the kingdom of God. And that's one of them. You know, we talked uh, this morning about, you know, getting older. And, you know, those of us that haven't reached perfection yet are, are getting older. But we don't have to speak, we don't have to help it along by speaking the things that the world speaks. You know what I mean? Um, it'll happen one way or the other, but don't help it. Don't help uh, speak things into your body that, uh, you know, will cause a, a detrimental lifestyle. And as she said, you know, a lot of my friends, that's what they do, you know, is they, they and that's what they have. That's what they're getting. They're getting what they're speaking. And, uh, you know, when I go out, I still... Uh, try to do things that I did when I was younger, and sometimes I'll pull a muscle or pull something, but it's still, I'm still able to do, you know, I'm 64 years old, and I'm still able to do just almost exactly what I have done all my life as far as, you know, the things I do for recreation and things like that. There's some chances that I don't take anymore, <clears throat> you know, and, uh, but that's not because I'm older and physically can't take the chance, it's because I'm older and I'm smarter. <laughs> and so that's the way, you know, I mean, I can still probably hop on, on James's motorcycle and see how fast it goes, but I'm older now, so, and, and age has nothing to do with it. I could still do it, I just don't do it because I'm smarter now, and I know that's the dumb thing to do. Amen? <clears throat> Okay, turn with me to 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, and uh, this is kind of going to take off a little bit on what we discussed Wednesday night, and I know that probably most of what I'm going to teach this morning, most everybody here knows or at least we think we know, but you know what, there's an internet audience out there. And even though we know it, I always like to go over things over and over and over again. You know, when I preach to myself, you know, I preach the same things sometimes for months on end. And I get just as much excitement as hearing myself say it over and over again. Even though I know the concepts, I like to preach and I like to... to I don't know, it's, there, it must be something to have to do with the invisible realm. You know, that you're punching holes, in, there's something about it, because I know it's not that I just like to hear myself talk. You know, because I could pick something like deer hunting or, or some earthly thing that I like to do, and I could talk about that, which I know probably, well, maybe you guys don't, but I know I do sometimes. But I really get excited, and a lot of times I can't even go back to sleep, and I'm preaching the same things over and over again. And most of the time, it's nothing that I'm going to preach here. It's something that maybe I preached a long time ago, but it has nothing to do with the message here, or I'm not going to preach in another church. That happens, but a lot of times I'm just going over it and over it and over it. It's just because it sounds so good. It sounds so right, and it does something to me. It causes something to rise up inside of me and believe it more. You know what I mean? Because I'm hearing God speak, even though it's me speaking, who's speaking through me? I didn't get this on my own, right? right. This, didn't come, this didn't come to me because I figured it out you know, with my own wisdom. It came to me because God has revealed it to me. And since God now speaks through men, 
I can speak something over and over and over again. And Paul did the same thing. You know, he reminded them over and over again. And you can speak something over and over again. And every time God speaks it, what happens? Faith can come alive. Faith can, you know, faith can grow. Faith can grow. So just because we've heard something once, it will already know that. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that your faith cannot grow even more. So you hear it over and over again, and what happens is, and, and I've watched this happen many times with all of us, you know, that teach up here. We're teaching something that we already know, but if it's coming with God's voice, faith comes to the people. And people get excited, even though they know this concept, or they know what's going on, you know, they know what's being taught, something comes alive in us. And we walk out of here, what? With faith that has grown. It's great when faith comes for something the first time, isn't it? But how about, let's look at it and say we want our faith to grow. Okay, this is uh, chapter 1, verse 18 in 1 Corinthians. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks always look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Then he says, brothers and sisters... Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore it is written, let, no one who bo- or let, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So I wanted to talk about the foolishness of God because, you know, the, uh, it, it talks about, you know, the message of the cross is foolishness what, to those that are perishing. Why? Because it looks such, like such a failure on the cross. You know, if we were to pick human wisdom or human philosophy, we would think that God would call lightning down from heaven and destroy the Romans or destroy the religious system. And that's how, we would, that's how human wisdom thinks. But God always, it always looks like defeat when you're actually winning. So when we lay our attitudes aside, when, we, when somebody gets on us or somebody yells at us, and we take that patiently, in human wisdom it looks like we lost. Because we want to get the upper hand. We want to be sure that they go away knowing that we're the boss or we got the upper hand. You see what I'm saying? But what happens is is when you yield and you give soft answers and you yield to the attitude of Christ, you know, it says that Jesus was reviled and he didn't revile back. He went as a lamb to the slaughter. See, that looks foolish. That looks stupid in the world's eyes. But see, that's where the power of God is. And if you want the length, if you want a length of the power of God in your life, this is the way we're going to have to act and react. And one of the things I really like about the foolishness of God is praise and worship. You know, we've, we've got people all across America, and how many times in churches, or how many times have we done it? We want to bind the devil. We talked about this Wednesday night. We say, and so what do we do? We take human wisdom, because that's how, listen, how do you take authority over somebody with human wisdom? Loud and what? Huh? Show some anger? How else? What else? Through intimidation, don't we? 
And so we try to we we take a scripture that the Bible says to take, to bind the devil, and we do we take human wisdom and we try to use anger, intimidation, and loud voice to try to bind him. And yet every time we have a visitor here in church, I read Psalms one forty nine. How many of you know what Psalms 149 says? It says to bind their kings with chains and fetters of iron. You want to bind the devil? Then do praise and worship. Do praise. Be foolishly clamorous, and you'll bind the devil. I mean, the Bible tells us how to do it, and yet what do we do? We immediately put human wisdom to it, and we say, I bind you, Satan. I take authority over you in the name of Jesus. And yet the Bible tells us how to do it. It says you praise. You praise him with the dance. You praise him with instruments, right? And what does praise mean? Boasting. In our God. Boasting. What, loud? So, is, so if I do this, is, that's part of it a little bit, isn't it? That's a start, isn't it? Yeah, this is a start, isn't it? And uh, there should be an increase always in, in other words, every message, every church service that we have should cause an increase in, in God's government in our life. That's what I'm always looking for. You know, I'm always going to preach from the standpoint of groaning myself to be further clothed with Christ and for the church to be further clothed. I'm never going to be satisfied. We can have a great service and great praise and worship, and man, it was great this morning, it wasn't it? Man, it was just wild. Yeah, and you know what? I'm, I'm happy with it now, but I'm already starting to become, it needs, we need more. We need more. And because I preach from that standpoint, and I believe that's most of the people's hearts in here, we're going to get more. Because all who ask receive. <laughs> See, it's, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not we ask and God's withholding saying, I'm just going to see how desperate they get and just about the time they're ready to give up, then I'll give them a little bit more just to put the carrot in front of the horse so that they'll pull this cart a little bit further. God wants us to have more. Yeah. If he's withholding at all, it's because he knows it'll kill us. It's protection. So praise is a major part of binding the devil. And like I said Wednesday night, I'm always amazed, and this is for people in the Internet, I'm always amazed when people say, bind the devil for the church service, and then go out there and stand like a stone. And I'm always thinking, that prayer didn't work. He's got you so bound up, you're still bound. You're taking authority over him. You're trying to loose the kingdom of God, but you're all bound up. And this is, you know, you've got to understand something, folks. And this is one of the few churches you're very blessed to be in this church. Because this church believes that it's action that causes all the promises of God to come into our lives. No, no you don't understand. Most people don't believe that. Most people have got the idea that these things have already been given to us. And all you have to do is believe. And you'll hear that constantly. You just believe. You just believe. And, that, and that's, that, that's a true statement. But what's attached to believing? Doing. Yeah, if you believe it, you do it. But you know what? That's, ne that's almost never said. I mean, the conditions are almost never given for the things of the kingdom of God. It's like once you got born again, how many times have you heard this? When you got born again, you're now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that. Romans. I'm not even sure what chapter. I've got to find it. I know I've got it under the line. So it won't take me long. Uh, it's towards the beginning. Yeah, it's in chapter 2. Verse 13, it says, For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. 
Now, see, unfortunately, most people, most preachers, when they teach this, they're, tell, they're saying that Paul is making an impossible statement. Because wasn't it Paul who said, no one can keep the law? Then what is Paul saying here? Well, we should know. Yeah, it's through God's Spirit. So he, but they miss that, and they think that what Paul is making like a sarcastic statement, that only those who, who obey the law can be righteous, and that... Jesus came because we can't obey the law, so as long as we acknowledge that he died for our sins, then we're okay. But it says only those who obey the law will be righteous. You know what? Praise him with the dance is a law. That's a law. Shout unto God, that's a law. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph, that's a law. Well, I just disagree with that. Then you I'm sorry, I can't help it. Yeah, I can't If you don't believe in the Bible, there's nothing I can do for you. What does the Bible say? The Bible says many will come to me in that day and say, "Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Didn't we do this?" And and what's he say? He says, "I never knew you." Hmm? Yeah. He said, many will call me Lord, Lord, but, but, who, but who are saved? Those who do the will of God. That's what he said. What, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? He says, only those that do the will of God. Now, what's the will of God? What's, be, what's being done in heaven? He said to pray, your will be done on earth as it's done in heaven. So what's being done in heaven? Worshiping. What kind of worship and praise is going on in heaven? High worship and high praise. They're falling off their thrones. Bowing. It's loud. Do you think it's boisterous? Who was it? Was it the, who was it that saw the, was it the shepherds or, or was it David or somebody when they were out and they saw the whole host of heaven praising God? That means they were being foolishly clamorous. See, that's a law. And Jesus came that we might obey the law. See, this is where they get messed up. If you go over here to Romans chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. And they put those two together, and they miss what's being said. There's a difference between obeying the law and the works of the law. And they they don't understand that. They think they're saying, they think that Paul is saying one and the same thing. No, obeying the law is different than the works of the law. All he's saying here, and we know this, again, we know this to be true, all he's saying is, is that, is that uh, when you, the works of the law is when you're trying to obey the law without the grace or the divine influence in the Spirit. And what happens when we try to do that? Huh? What happens? Death? Can we say pride? Arrogance? Self-righteousness? Critical? judgmental, that's the works of the law without the grace of God. But if God gives us a grace to obey the law, then what do you have? Thank you, thank you, thank you, yes. Goodness, joy, peace, life. Um, How about humility? See, how about humility? And what happens is, is so many times we end up with a lot of knowledge, and this is what I see happening a lot in the church, is we have knowledge of certain things. And, you know, I discussed this, I think, Wednesday night. We surround it, we, get, we, we buy everybody's book on everything. Come on, blow this down I mean, we just do. We buy every book there is. We, we search to and fro for every preacher we can listen to. And, you know, those things aren't bad as long as they're kept in their proper order. But what happens is, is we start gaining all of this knowledge, and we think knowledge equals salvation. You know, we surround ourselves with 19 translations of the Bible. You know, we put angels on our, you know, we've got angel lampstands and angel nightlights, and we've got all this religious stuff, and we begin to think that knowledge is what saves us. And because I know these things, now I'm saved. You know what most people think that faith is? 
is that your mental knowledge becomes, and that's why they keep, many times why they keep hitting things over and over again. We hit things over and over again. Why? Because we want to hear God speak. But they keep hitting things over and over again because they think if your mental knowledge gets strong enough, eventually it rolls over into faith and it turns into faith. And that's not how it works. Faith comes by hearing God speak. And so we surround ourselves when we buy everybody's book on everything, again, rather than pressing God as we learned last week. And it's the foolishness of God that, will, that, that actually becomes wisdom. You would never think, the world would never think that by you jumping and dancing, you're actually binding sickness, disease, and destruction in your life. Who's going to think that? Who's going to think that? They're going to think you're nuts. They're going to think you're crazy. And that's one of the reasons that we're made so much fun of. You know, it, we're the church that has karaoke. <laughs> Did you know that? Yeah, that's what, they, that's what some people say. Well, they got karaoke out there at that church. That's good. See, they mean it as a slam. I take it as a compliment. You know why? Because with karaoke, you have to carry the ball. You don't have somebody entertaining you. You now have to do the singing. You know, now have to do the leading. You see what I'm saying? And so it actually becomes, it's actually a, see, it's foolishness to them, isn't it? Because we have karaoke out here. But see, it's the power of God because it creates in people this idea, I've got to carry the ball. There's no band up there to carry the ball. You have to do it. <clears throat> and see, that's foolishness to them. That's why they mock us and they laugh at us. And they laugh at us for what we believe. You know, we're, we're believing for victory. I mean, how crazy is it to believe in victory over death as our hair's turning gray? How crazy is that? But that's the power of God. Everything that we believe here is, if you look at it in the, in the, in the eyes of the world, is foolishness. <laughs> that lets you know you're on the right track. Or at least that's one of the, the, the uh, conditions to know that you're on the right track, is we're believing for things that are impossible. That worldly wisdom always judges by what they see and what goes on in the world. And so it's very difficult for you and I as church people to live in that system and constantly being trying to be contaminated by that system and keep the foolishness of God. It's very easy to, to cross over into the wisdom of men. So we can sit here and we can teach you the principles of the things of the kingdom and teach you, you know, that we shouldn't be saying, what, you know, we're getting old or this or that or anything else. But how many times does it slip out? How many times when you're outside of this church, you say, well, you know, I'm getting older. Those are the things that happen. So you're being contaminated by the wisdom of this world. And that's what, that's what it's designed to do is to contaminate us. And so I know, we all know this stuff, but, uh, you know, what's being done in heaven is praise and worship. What, how many elders are there? I think I brought this up. Did I bring this up Wednesday night? There's 24. John didn't say I saw 24 elders, or I saw 24 thrones and 17 elders on the thrones. Because seven of them were at the Chiefs game. Seven of them were tired of falling off their thrones. They've been doing it for 10,000 years. So they decided to stay home because they just wanted to take a day off. They'd really been working hard. You don't find any of that. So, you know, I, I tell you, I'm real big on church service because church service is where we gain the corporate anointing. Mark chapter 10. <clears throat> tell me what else is going on in heaven. Loud what? Loud, loud what? Music? Well, it's just too loud in here. Well, I understand we still have our fallen nature ears, but that's what earplugs are for. And that's what tissue is for. You know, and see, here's the thing, is if it was too loud for you, and you really want to give God his value and his worth, you'd find a way you'd find a way that it wouldn't hurt your ears. So that you wouldn't have to, you know, you know what I mean? 
And I was talking, you know, sometimes I watch some of these kids here and they put their hands up over their ears like that. Well, then you really can't use your hands to praise God with him. Now can you while you're doing this? So you would find a way to, so that your ears didn't hurt, even if you had to buy a pair of shooting ear plug, ear muffs, and wear them. You'd find a way that you could give God his value and his worth. And that's what's going to cause the foolishness of God to come into your life, and then the power of God comes into your life. If you're not going to be foolish for God, don't expect any power and don't expect any authority. As God's government increases, listen, as God's government increases in your life, then your righteousness increases, your faith increases, your justification increases, your grace increases, your authority increases, your joy increases. And your health. Everything that we believe here as God's government. Now, what does God's government mean? That means he rules over you. That whatever he says goes. And he said, praise the Lord. Right? With everything that is within you. You love, the God, love God with what? All your heart. All your mind. All your strength. And all your emotions. What? You think new songs are being sung in heaven? Uh, how much do you think people stop singing? Okay, what else is going on in heaven? Okay, joy. What? Peace. What else? Thank you. What? Happy. What else? Overwhelmed? How about divine health? Is that going on in heaven? Yes. How about prosperity? Is that going on in heaven? How many poor people do you think there are in heaven? How many sick people? How many people are dying? How many funerals do they hold? How much arthritis is in heaven? How many glasses do you think are in heaven? Huh? <laughs> I mean, we could go on and on and on. And, and Jesus said, yeah, there's no darkness. Yeah, how much, how much offense, how many people do you think are offended in heaven? You don't think those elders ever get offended? You don't think if one elder gets off the throne before another one does and gets offended at, that, at one of the other ones? Do you think that the people or the angels or whoever it is that's in heaven watches and the 24 elders fall off the throne, gets offended because they don't get to be an elder and fall off their throne? You see, you see what I'm... And Jesus said for us to pray for that to happen here on earth. Well, I, I, you know, I think it was Pastor Bill that taught that, and, and it was such a great, to me, great revelation. But, you know, uh, I can't even think of his last name now. He lives in Reading. <laughs> Yeah, Bill Johnson. That's such a difficult name to remember. <laughs> yeah, he taught that, and I thought, man, what a great, you know, what a great, you know, uh, thing to see in that in the Lord's prayer. Because every church, every church has it. Every church, you know, most people have it in their. A lot of people have it in their homes, and it was even on Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. It's even in an earthly movie. Everybody knows. The, most everybody, even people who don't go to church, know the Lord's Prayer. They can start at least start to quote it to you. And so I thought that was just a great revelation to come forth from him. And it's really stuck with me because, you know, Jesus said, only those who do the will of my Father will be, Lord, will be in heaven. But those that do the will. And that means that you're trying to get God's will that's being done in heaven here on earth. So anybody who's not kingdom now is disagreeing with the body. You're, you're disregarding what Jesus said. But see, we use the earth's wisdom and the earth's knowledge to say, well, we can't walk without sin. We can't get victory over death. We can't get victory over sin. These are just things that happen. That's life. 
Look what it says here in Mark chapter 10. If I've got to find it here. Yeah, here it is. <clears throat> and I'm going to start get kind of in the middle of the story. This is when uh, James and John were asking who could sit at his, you know, one on his right side and one on his left side, okay? And he said, when the ten heard about this, they became... Oh, 41. It says, when the ten heard about this... They became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. And see, this is exactly how we try to take authority over the devil, is we try to lord it over him. And that's why it mainly doesn't work. So what did Jesus say? <clears throat> so if you want authority, it says not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be what? Servant. Oh no, surely not. No, that's foolish. What, you're going to have authority over, over the devil by becoming a servant? And whoever wants to be first must be slave of some. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now we know in here that we want to be like Jesus. That's our prayer, isn't it? Our prayer is to be just like him, to be formed and changed into his image. And notice, he gave his life as a ransom for many. And I've heard preachers preach this before. They've said, well, Jesus died and he paid the price so you don't have to. That's total error. He paid the price to show you how to pay the price. Not so that you wouldn't have to. Yeah, you don't have to be crucified like he did, but you know, it just but it still says you were crucified with who? He still says to pick up your cross and what? Follow him. So he laid down his life. In other words, he went to the cross in obedience to the Father. And you know, Kathy shared this one time and I really like it. You know, he didn't die for you. I see fire coming out of the camera. He died in obedience to his father. It ended up being for you. But he died in obedience to his father. And it's important that we understand that God always comes first. But it says he gave his life as a ransom for many. So we discussed in here Wednesday night, and this is one of the reasons that I do what, what we do. You know, when Kathy and I attend another church, and we've been to many. You know, we attend one now regularly in Grand Junction. But we've tried several in Grand Junction. We tried some in Delta. We went to Kremlin. I've been to Carbondale. You know, whenever we go on vacation, we try. Whenever we go on vacation, we try to go to a church. Why? Because we want to give our life as a ransom for many. Now, what does that mean? That means that when we get there, I mean, how, how, how do you think we feel when we're the only two that are jumping and dancing and everybody else is just kind of standing there? Huh? Yeah, staring, foolish. But what are we trying to do? We're trying to give our life as a ransom for all of that church. You know, most people when they attend church, a different church, they carry with them, I've used this before, a visitor spirit. You know what a visitor spirit is? You are a visitor in the natural simply because we live in this system. If we lived in the spirit realm, there'd be no distance, and we would all be in one church service. Even if there were many, it'd still be one church service. But because we live in this system, we are actually physically visitors, but you don't have to carry the visitor spirit. You know what the visitor spirit is? It's the spirit that sits in the back, and you become a spectator. You don't want to join the group. You want to be apart from the group. This can be during praise and worship. It can be during, during teaching. Remember the guy that was in the, that when we were in the other building? That during praise and worship, he would stand back there at the back, and it was an old restaurant. And right inside the door, there was a counter where, where they used to have the cash register. He'd stand there leaned against that while we're all in the chair singing. He's back there just kind of observing. What did he have? He had that visitor spirit. In other words, he wasn't going to give his life as a ransom for many. And so when we do that, we come, when we go to another church, we want to jump, we want to praise, we want to sing loud, we want to amen the pastor. Why? Because we're giving our life as a ransom for those people. You say, well, what do you mean? Those people go through things just like we do. Did you know that? When those people stand up there and they're leading and, and singing and, and uh, playing their instruments, most of them, maybe not all of them, but most of them, what, are they, what do you think they're thinking? 
Okay, that's okay. That's good. You hope we're doing it right. What else? I hope people connect with God. What else? Come on. What those of you that lead? What's going through your head when you're up here preaching? When you're up here singing? What's going through your head? What do they need? What else? Come on. I'm looking for something else. You want them to connect with God. What else? Self-consciousness. All right, now we're getting there. What, what else? Fear of man. What else? Huh? Inadequacy. What else? What are you hearing when you're up here? When you're, when, when, huh? What? You feel intimidated? What else, Terry? Like, they're not coming with you. What else? They think you look stupid. They think you look stupid. What else? They're bored. Huh? They're bored. They're bored. What, did you have something? Oh, they're bored. What else? Hate all the songs you. Yeah, hate all the songs you picked out. Nobody's entering in. I'm. I. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not called to this. I'm not called to this. What all? See, look at all the things that. No, listen. Nobody is any different than you. When they're up there standing there and you attend another church and, and those, they may look like they're all polished. But I know how the enemy works. And there's nothing new under the sun. They're listening to the same thing. So when we go, we want to jump, we want to dance, we want to try to enter in. Why? Because we're trying to pay a ransom and release them from those thoughts. There's not only those thoughts, but what about what happened to them during the week? What if, them lo- what if one of them lost a loved one? Plus they're listening to all of that. What if they lost their job? What if, huh? He just lost his dad. And he led worship. And when his baby was in the, and people get in, and if you will join in with the group, what are you doing? You're giving your life, not only for those people leading worship, but also for the people that are standing there. Because they're going to look at you, and they may, listen, I'm not saying everybody wants that ransom paid. They didn't for Jesus, did they? Not everybody wanted the ransom paid. But you become a servant, and you lay your life down, and you become a ransom for people. See? It, the Bible says a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. So somebody who, like that guy who'd sit back there during praise and worship, or, or the person who want, doesn't want to be part of the group, they're seeking their own desire. And this is not about seeking your own desire. This is about becoming a servant and becoming a ransom for many. And you're, because you're, you're, uh, you're, trying to, you're paying a price. Yeah, because when you're standing there and you're the only two people... You're paying a price. Now, it's not a big one. It's not like what Jesus paid, but it's still a price. And you're paying that price. Why? Because you're trying to draw other people in. I mean, let me ask you a question, those of you who do praise and worship. Do you like it better when people are yelling and singing loud and flagging and dancing or when they just stand there? When they're acting out what God, right? When they're acting out, see? So when you do that, obviously we do it for God first, right? I always put God first, so don't hear what I'm not saying. But why do we do it for God first? It's so that the overflow will now pay a ransom for the person who's up here leading. It's the same way when somebody preaches. You know, when you're up here preaching and everybody's yawning and half the people are asleep, They're not pulling on the anointing. I mean, I remember listening to a guy that we had here in church, and he was a Rhema graduate, and I mean, it was tough. Because all he did was get his old notes out and preach off his old notes. But you know what? I still focused. I still, you know, uh, uh, sometimes what causes yawning is you're not breathing deep enough. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so she sits up. <laughs> See, sometimes I start yawning when I'm singing. Don't misunderstand, I'm not bored. It's when I'm singing high notes, I'm not taking enough air in because I'm, I'm keeping my throat closed to make high notes. And so I'll have to stop. and do, I, I do about 10 of those, and the yawning will stop. But don't think I'm bored and don't think that, oh, man, because if you see somebody yawning during praise and worship, what's the enemy going to tell you? Huh? 
Yeah. I mean, how many times has the enemy told you things and you found out later it wasn't true? I know that's probably never happened to anybody, right? And you found out that they said that or they looked that way or they did that certain particular thing and it was something that you never even thought of. Yeah, you know why? Because the devil didn't want you to think of that. He gave you his own thought. Many times people are thinking or meditating things. They may look bored, but something that you said earlier, they may still be on that. And so they may not be paying attention to what you're saying at the moment because they're still stuck on something that God spoke to them earlier. And so that's what you have to do is you have to go in with an attitude is, and that's why I like church because church is where the ransom is paid. If there's no church, I don't have to pay any ransom. What do I know? I have to lay my life down for anybody. If I sit at home and do my big Bible studies, put on the internet my big revelations of, like I said, the four horsemen of the apocalypse or the seven spirits of the churches or the candlestick and the candles and the inner court and outer court and holy of holies, and I give all those revelations, there's no ransom to be paid. Church is where the ransom is paid. And that's why I'm such a big, big, uh, uh, you know... Proponent, can I say that? I almost said opponent, but I said, I, a, a proponent of being in church because that's where we pay the ransom. That's where you become the servant of all. Well, I talk to unbelievers out there. Yeah, but you see, by you not being in church, remember what I told you about binding and loosing? You're carrying an atmosphere of independence and isolation. Doesn't matter what you, you may be helping people out there and, and ministering to them or giving them tracts or whatever it is that you're doing. But if you're not in a church, you're not paying a ransom. Because that's where, that's where the price is really paid. That's what Jesus came for. He came for his people. Not to be isolated, but to be a group. And that's where the ransom is paid. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's sparks flying between people. And this is where we learn how to pay a ransom. This is where we learn how to be, you want to be like Jesus? That's what you're going to have to be. You're going to have to love his body and pay a ransom for it. When, so when we come to church, you can't come in here you know, with the attitude, yeah, you may have had a bad week. Some things may have happened to you as well. But you lay, pick up your cross, lay down your life, and you become a ransom for many. And you have no idea what you, what you do, how it could change somebody's life. You may never know of most of the people whom you paid a ransom for. But what does it mean? It, it, what does a ransom mean? Yeah. It means to loose. So there's your bondage. It means to loose, and it means a price paid for setting men free. And yes, Jesus paid the ultimate price, didn't he? But he paid it. He, huh? Yeah, he, yeah, we're his body. So if you want to be like him, then this mind has to be in you. And if it's not in you, then, sorry, you don't have the righteousness of God. You're not justified. You're not being saved by grace. What was the other thing? <laughs> huh? Well, yeah, but that... Um... Oh, and you have no authority. You can yell and, make, and, and you can fool people into thinking that you're a great spiritual giant with your voice and with your antics. But it shouldn't take people too long to figure out if they observe your life that you have no authority. You just talk like we do. You see what I mean? And people do that all the time. And it, 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 I just think, you know, there's a way that the Bible told us to have authority, and it's not the world's way. It's not by lording it over the devil. There's a legal way of doing it. And he told us how to do it. And the more you praise and worship, and the more you yield to the things of God, and the more his government increases, then the more authority you have. The more power you will have. Would you say the church is real powerful? Hmm? When you read what the Bible says we're supposed to be, that the nations are supposed to be fearing us, is that what you see? Then obviously all our jumping around and yelling at the devil has not done much good. 
And look, and again, I don't want to lock God in a box. Don't hear what I'm not saying. If God moves upon you to speak authoritatively, then that's fine. But so many times, we don't do that. We just do it because that's our human wisdom. It's not God moving on us. We think that's how it's always been done, and so that's the way we're going to do it. You know, the word authority means that when he says you have power or authority over all the power of the enemy, that just simply means permission to do so. Didn't tell you that you were supposed to yell and scream and be real. uh. When you have permission to do so, you don't have to be that way. Has anybody ever gotten permission to do something from an authority? What was it? What did you get? What did you have permission to do, Joseph? You raise your hand. You don't remember, huh? Go help some different students. What else? What? Use the company charge card. All right, when you use the company, you have permission to use the company charge card, right? Did you walk into the store and start yelling at the person and say, I have permission to use this? (laughs) What did you do? But I know, but what did you do? When you you just handed it to him, right? And you had permission. And when people know that you have permission, what do they do? They let you use it. And so when the devil knows that you have authority, you don't have to yell and scream. I'm not saying God may not do that sometimes, but I'm saying we use that as a tool or as a method of doing things. And so when, I, so when we read the Bible and we, say, and we read where Jesus said, come out of him, we automatically put our own lording it over it in what we're reading. And we get this impression that Jesus said, come out of him. He might have just said, come out of him. Because he had permission to do so. <laughs> Remember when, uh, I, I love this story about Pastor Steve, when he, when he said that guy was running at him and was going to hit him or something. Remember what he did? What did he do? He, he rushed out and what? And said, you're a good boy. Oh, I'm going to rebuke you in the name of Jesus. He didn't do any of that. He just said, was, now I think he said shalom, didn't he? That was after. That was after? He said, you're a good boy, shalom. And he collapsed. Because when you have permission, you don't have to do all those antics. But so many times we use some of those antics to try to fool the devil like we're going to lord it over him and we're going to intimidate him. You're not going to intimidate him, Jack. You can do that all you want, but when you have permission to do something, and the only time we have permission is when we're under authority. In other words, because you were under authority, you were given that charge card, right? You couldn't do with it what you wanted, right? Gee, how come? Why? Because you're under authority. Because you're under authority, and you've been given a specific tool to use in a specific way. And that's the way that God works, and that's the way that Jesus worked. Okay, so we need to keep that in mind is that you and I, as the government of God increases in our life, our authority and our power will increase in our life. And so many times people want this authority and power, but they don't want God's government. They're going to show up in church twice twice a month. They're going to float from church to church. Those are the people I really like. See, there's, there's no ransom being paid. If you're floating from church to church, you have to get involved with people. You have to speak with people, make eye contact with people. You know, a lot of people, and I know we here in this church, a lot of you live in different towns, don't you? But we interact with each other, don't we? We know each other. We talk with each other. We speak with each other after church. A lot of people like to go to uh, churches outside of town. Why? Because there's no accountability, and they don't want anybody to know anything about their life. So they'll go in. It, during the service, and as soon as the service is, they're out the door, back to their town. Because they don't want to get involved with anybody. Because people, you know, when you pay a ransom, what does that mean? How fun is that? How, yeah, it costs you something, doesn't it? Well, see, people don't want to be around people because it costs you something. But people want to run out of here because they don't want to pay any price. 
And you have to be very careful. I mean, we have to learn how to be, become ransom payers. <laughs> and that doesn't mean, like we discussed, I think it was Brenda brought this up Wednesday night, that we always want to do battle when something, if it was it you, when something comes against us, that's when we want to go into battle mode, and we're always supposed to be in battle mode? Well, you're always supposed to be in ransom mode. Do you know what that means? That means just because somebody is not, huh? Yeah, you're, in other words, just because somebody's not going through something, now I'm going to pay a ransom. It's, you're going to speak to people. You know, we speak to these, these kids in here we, after service. We talk with them, or at least I do. You know, I, I, I want to find out their interests. And I want to say good things over them. You know, I know Brandon is a smart kid. You know, Brandon has got, a, you know, all of them are smart kids. It's just that some of them won't use their smarts where they're supposed to. <laughs> but they're all intelligent kids. And, and, they, and, and if, they would, if they'll use their smarts, even without God, if they use their smarts, they can go a long ways. But it's going to take somebody to recognize their smarts and talk to them about things they're interested in and talk to them and just get them to, you know, to, 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 to open up their hearts when you speak to them and find out what they're interested in and, and tell them that they do good and that they're, you know, I mean... From what Brandon is telling me, you know, he's a good worker, he's, he's conscientious. That's hard to find in a teenager. That's hard to find in a young person. I'm not saying they're perfect. <clears throat> I'm not saying they're perfect. We're not either. But the idea is to pay a ransom for people. And as that increases in your life, then God's authority and power will increase. As your praise and worship increases, in other words, not singing, just being foolishly clamorous and giving what God, what he likes, and then ministering to people as a ransom. You see what I mean? That guy may need you to be jumping and dancing. That guy may need you to be drawn and pulling out of him when he's preaching, or that gal. You know, those band leaders, like, like she said, one of them said, just keep your eyes on them, just keep your eyes on them. Now, why are they, yeah, when we're worshiping, why, why, why were they doing that? Because, huh? Because it was encouragement, and she said she was afraid. So she said, just keep your eyes on them. Now, tell me, were we paying a ransom for her? There you go. That's what we're supposed to do. And you can't walk into a service. And listen, is God going to give you stuff? I'm not taking that away from God. Is God going to give you stuff? Sure he is. But we should grow past the point of where we're coming in here wanting to get stuff all the time. You should come in here with the idea of, I'm now going to pay a ransom. I am now going to join with this group of people. I want to be connected to these, these people. Is it uncomfortable? Absolutely. Is it something we really love doing? Sometimes. But sometimes it's very, very difficult, isn't it? Sometimes it's very difficult to, uh, to join with people, isn't it? Um, yeah, and, and if you've been with them all day, but that's the name of the game, is you pay a ransom. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you become a servant. Any questions? That's the foolishness of God. Everything, like I said, everything with God seems to be the opposite of the way it is in the kingdom of this world. In order to get, you give. You know, in order to get life, you die. <laughs> See, all of that is foolishness. But I really wanted to hit the praise and worship thing because, you know, praise and worship, tithing's another one. You know, how tough is it for that? How tough is it to tithe? I mean, in comparison... Uh, let me ask you a question. Would you rather be tithing or getting chemo treatments? You know, I was out in my ranger the other day, and I was on my way deer hunting, and I thought, I'll bet this is going to be a trap. You know, it quit raining for a little bit. And I was like, man, as soon as I get out there, the tree is going to start raining. And as I'm thinking that, I'm thinking, you know what? This thought came into my head. There are people who are getting chemo treatments right now that would grad gladly trade you places to be out here in the rain. Going to do what you're going to do. Even if they didn't like hunting, 
They'd gladly trade you places to go out there and sit in a tree stand and get rained on for what they're going through. And, of course, it happened. I got out in the stand and it started raining. <laughs> but I was smiling the whole way. I said, yep, I'm glad I get to feel these raindrops because I could be in a hospital. Yeah. I just felt like I wanted to share this. Um, you know, God can teach you a great deal through your job if you'll let him. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I've always kind of been my own boss where I'm at, and and I'm good at it. And sometimes when you get really good at something, you expect everybody else to be good at it as well. And you get a little bossy and maybe a little pushy, and you can hurt people mm -hmm. really bad, especially if you've got a if you've got an anointing to speak or pray or whatever. The words that come out of your mouth and anger or self-righteousness can be just as damaging as a good prayer can be anointed. Yeah. And especially when you're working around kids or damaged adults, you, can't, you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. And that's part of laying down your life is because sometimes if you're really good at something, you expect other people to be as good at it. And I just want to give this example. Um, so I'm working, and I'm a very hard worker, and I always go above and beyond because that's mm -hmm. what God expects, you know. But I'm tired, and I expect other people to pick up the slack too, and they don't. And so I began to ask God, what do I do, you know, because this one person wouldn't pick up their slack, and they were always off, and they didn't finish things, and they would do things they weren't supposed to and not do things they mm -hmm. weren't supposed to. You know, those kind of irritating little things that fly around your head. And instead of what I wanted to do was chew them out or make them feel bad or, you know, kind of guilt them into doing the right thing or saying, well, I'm just going to leave all my work for you to do then if I got to do all your work. You know, all that stuff that mm -hmm. goes through your head. And God told me that it was my job to be the example that it was my job to, to do work around other people and let them watch and to be kind to them and to love them. And it, it was really hard to do the first couple of weeks. And then I just, God just gave me the grace to do it. And, and this person started doing the work too, mm -hmm. you know. And I found out later that if I had said the things to them that I wanted to say and that I, if I had used the attitude that I had instead of letting, it, letting God deal with me and laying it down, that woman had been beaten most of her life and had been verbally abused to the point of, I, I just, I won't go into great detail, mm -hmm. yeah. but if I had treated her the way that I wanted to treat her, mm -hmm. thinking that I was justified in doing so because I'm such a great worker or I'm, you know, I would have destroyed her with the words of my mouth and my attitude mm -hmm. because of what I'm called to do. You know, my voice will be and has been used to heal people and to speak words to people and stuff. But if you let the enemy use that gift... Mm -hmm. And you don't lay it down when God says lay it down. You can destroy people and hurt them for the rest of their life. And when they think of you, they're going to think of what? Just like when people think of you about the words you gave them that changed their life mm -hmm. 20 years ago, they're going to think of you about the way that you acted and treated them mm -hmm. as a leader or somebody over them. They're going to think of you that way. Instead of, God isn't going to even be involved in it. It's just going to be another sword in their heart. And so in you saying this, God's given us great authority by the way that we act around other people and the way that we respond and the way that we treat people. Because everybody, <coughs> if you are in a workplace at all, there's always the one that's the boss, very bossy, overbearing, critical, not patient. You know, you always have those kind of people around you, but don't be that person. Mm -hmm. Don't be that person. If you love God and you want God, <clears throat> you, he has got to teach us how to use our mouth and our attitude and respond the way that he responds because we do not know what these kids have been through, 
We do not know what the people have been through that are around us because they're not telling you because they don't trust you because you'll yell at them or you'll scream at them or you'll whatever. You'll treat them just like everybody else has. And if we want an avenue for people to be able to trust to come in to find God, then we've got to watch. We've got to watch the way we use our authority mm -hmm. and the way we use our gift and our the passion, you know. Yeah. And I, I learned that the hard way, you know, when I worked at the academy. But God, God wants, to, wants to use us in so many ways that we don't even know. And if we can't let him show us what authority is, show us what laying down our life is, showing what being a bondservant is, we're, we're going to spin our tires for, for a while. And I don't want to spin yeah. anymore. You well, know, and when it comes right down to it, we can hear it from the pulpit. But it's when we're out there mm -hmm. among people and the world that we're still very selfish. We're still very self-indulgent. And we still think about our own desires before we ever think about anybody else's. And it's kind of <coughs> scary when you think about being in this for so long and we still have those tendencies. And I just really felt like saying that this morning because I really have had such a a broken heart about a lot of this stuff is that God, we can sit here in church and we can treat each other well and we can hear about authority and we can hear about laying down our life and we can hear about being a bond servant. But how we treat people outside of here on a day to day basis shows where our heart's at. And that just breaks my heart, you know, because Jesus, you didn't see Jesus doing that to broken people. You didn't see him doing that. He only spoke with words of authority and wisdom to the religious sect who weren't listening, and that's only when God told him to. But everybody else, the, the people that, the gluttons and the wine bibbers, and they all loved him. Yeah. You know. But you, there's, we, we need to do the flip side of that as well, is that we have to discern the difference between people who've had a hard life and people who are just being lazy. Oh, true. <clears throat> true, I get that. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Like, like you say, we've been in this church. Now, I don't know who all works where or what have you, but, you know, after you've been in this church here a while, you ought to be the best worker there is. You know, one of the things that <clears throat> used to bother me, like at the store, was is that, and these were people who didn't have a bad upbringing because I know who they were, is that, you know, I always went in, I always liked my schedule at 5, to come in at 5 in the morning because I got two hours before the store opened. And man, I could really get a lot of stuff done in those two hours without people bothering me. But then there was other people who would come in at five, and they'd have a cup of coffee, smoke a cigarette, have another cup of coffee, stand around, talk to the truck driver, you know, talk, 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 talk. Then when they got behind during the day, then they'd be mad at the customers. You know, then they'd be all upset and throwing things around the back room and this and that and everything else. And you see, uh, one of the things one boss told me was that it costs us money to work ahead. And I thought, God, that, that is, and then when a new, well, he, had, he finally resigned. You know, he, yeah, they made him resign. And then when the new boss came in, I told him that, and he just shook his head and said, I can't believe that. And I said, well, that's what he said. It's, it costs us money to work ahead. And I think, no, it costs you money to work behind. It always is good to work ahead and get things done. So if you work in this church and you get two hours to work and you, stand, you spend all the time talking, that's not because of your bad upbringing. That's because you're a big mouth and you, can't, you just want to take, be paid to do something for nothing. If, if there's a, you know, a slack of time or something like that, you ought to be working like a banshee to get stuff done so that when it does get busy, now you're ready for them. Yeah, I hated working from behind. I absolutely hate that. I hate it when, when we got time and you can fill stuff up and then you're busy up the front end and you've got people asking for things in the back, you know, that you had time to fill up or, or things that you could have done. And so you have to use discernment on when people are, need to be trained, you know, like you say, and be treated correctly versus people that are just, you know, going to take advantage of you. And see, Jesus was, yes, he tr treated broken people that way. But as soon as they started getting free of their brokenness, he started getting harder and harder with them. You know, yeah, he didn't, he didn't just keep on letting them get away with stuff, see? 
And, uh, you know, and that's why it was so difficult on the Pharisees is because they had the law. You know, they didn't have Bibles like we did. They only had one set of parchments, and it was in their synagogue that they, got to, that they got to study all the time. And those other people, they had to work all the time. See, we know, now all have Bibles. And, you know, my, my m- message most of the time is, yes, we, we do have unbelievers, but my message is basically to the church people. You know, to get us set free, and then when we get us set free, it should overflow into the unbelievers. You see, now I know some people have, you know, have a heart for the unbeliever, but my heart has always been for the church people because if we can get the church straightened out, I got a feeling the unbelievers will get straightened out. Because if we don't straighten out the church, we just bring them in and make them twice the son of hell that we that that the church has been. <clears throat> Well, that's because we've used human wisdom instead of the foolishness of God. And we've used, instead of using the foolish things like Jesus did, how victorious was Jesus? But how did he look victorious? He didn't. See, we want to look victorious. That's our problem, is we want to look like we have the victory. And that can only come with human wisdom. If you want to look like you have victory, it's going to be through human wisdom. If you want to have spiritual victory, you're going to look like a fool. Yeah, and that's why we have karaoke, and that's why we jump and dance, and that's why we do foolish things, you know. That's why Kathy walks around the church like this, you know, (laughs) round and round and round. It looks foolish, but it created something, you know, that people needed to do. And the church wants to look like it's powerful. It wants to look like it's successful. It wants to look like it has authority and power. And when you want to look like it, then you don't have it. It takes the foolishness of God. And if you read through your Bible, it, you always find that out. It's the foolishness of God, 300 against 120,000. Now, how foolish is that? You know, you go out and you look for a city whose maker and builder is God. You build a boat when it hasn't rained. It always looks stupid and foolish. Now, I'm not saying to be stupid and foolish. I'm saying that when God speaks, it will look that way. Praise and worship looks foolish. When you're jumping around, how's that going to set anybody free? People are mocking you in the church. They're laughing at you for doing that. Remember we visited the church here in town, and you know they were pretending like they were us, and they mock us and all of that? Yeah, do you know why? Because those demons know that that's their judgment. See? And you're setting somebody free. Somebody is looking at you. Those people don't want the ransom, but there'll be somebody there that wants the ransom, and those are the ones you have to focus on. And that's what you have to go for, is you're going to pay a ransom for somebody, somewhere. Even if they don't want it, you're going to pay the ransom. That's the heart that has to be in you. And if it's not in you, then forget the authority, the righteousness, the justification, the power, and all of that. It, it, the grace, it's not, it's not working in your life. Is the system there for you to operate in it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Has Jesus given us that system? Yes, but it's all based upon the condition of the increase of God's government in your life. And if that's not increasing in your life, you ain't going to get it. You can listen to, you can surround yourself with preachers and Bibles and books that tell you you've got it, and you'll live your whole life without it. And one day your flood will come, and what you've built is going to determine whether you float and come to, to rest and rule the world, or whether you sink and, and drown. As long as things are going good, boy, it's great, isn't it? Boy, we got the power, we got authority, but boy, the minute the flood comes, now we're going to find out what we've really built. She needs the... So since you guys went to Grand Junction and Mm -hmm. came back and the conversations and stuff that you guys have shared, it's been... uh, I don't know if I want to say encouraging or what, but I have went into other churches before, mm-hmm. okay? And it's like you go with every intention to worship and to give God everything, but it's like as soon as you walk in the door, you feel the oppression That's and right. the chains mm-hmm. and everything that just comes upon you. And then you have the thinking or the human knowledge of like, well, we're in a different house of the Lord. So since we're in a different house of the Lord, we need to follow their rules in the way that they do it. But really, we're under one body. We're exactly. So 
I just kind of want to say thank you for sharing all this stuff yeah. because I am going away uh, in December and it's going to be a week that I'm gone. And so I've been praying about what church to go to mm-hmm. and I don't want to go and feel the chains. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't want to go and have bondage put on me. Right. I want to go and I want to bring freedom. Right. And so paying the ransom. So it's like, okay, no matter what, may I pay the ransom? Yeah. yeah. See, this is what I want to tell you. Is that, you know that oppression that you feel? Yeah, you're going to feel it. That's how you know you're going to pay a ransom. Because a ransom isn't fun. That doesn't, yeah, you, nobody wants to pay a ransom. You know, uh, yeah, who wants to pay that? See, that's how you know now that it's a ransom. And I want to say this, too. I better say this, and, and you all know this, but it still <laughs> needs to be said, is you don't want to be obnoxious. You know, some people do that, again, according to the letter. You know, in other words, their attitude isn't, you know, your attitude has to be, I want to pay a ransom, not look how spiritual I am. You know, look how free I am. You see what I mean? You want, to pay, you want to have the attitude of paying a ransom. So you may not be real wild like maybe you are here, but you'll be wilder than they are. You know, God will give you the way to do it in such a way that you're not obnoxious. I mean, some people will think you are, but you have to keep your heart, I'm here to pay a ransom. Do you understand that? Because there's a lot of people who do things trying to look how spiritual they are. And, but they're not, they're, not, they're not interested, again, they're not interested in paying a ransom. They're just interested in letting everybody see how spiritual they are. And I know you don't have that. That's right. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying I want to say that for the Internet. Is, but you are going to feel oppression, and that's when you know I'm paying a ransom. Yeah. So you, use, you use the oppression as a... Uh, uh, catapult right. to push you right. into the ransom. And that's the wisdom that the devil does not yes. understand. That's yes. the, the, or they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. See, that's the wisdom. See, it's foolishness. See, men's wisdom would say, oh no, I've got to stay just like them. I don't want to make any waves. That's men's wisdom. But God's wisdom said, you take what the devil means for evil and you turn it into good and I'm going to pay this ransom. That's how it works. <clears throat> Anybody else? I went to uh, a church, this has been a while back, but I went to church with my sister, and mm. I felt that when I went in, that oppression. But the songs that they were singing were songs that you, I, I don't know how people can stand still. Yeah, when yeah. The, you know, There are just some songs that you, I don't understand that. And so I started raising my hands, just raising my hands. And yeah. pretty soon I see hands going up around me. It was like, it was like suddenly people had permission to do something that they wouldn't normally yeah. do. Right. So it, it was worth it. But you feel that, like, do I just stand here like everybody right. else? Yeah. But I can't do that. When I start hearing some of that music, it's like, I don't understand how you can praise God and just stand there. Yeah. <laughs> but I know that's how we were raised here sure. you know so there's a sure. there's that excitement in the music but there's all you also feel that yeah. oppression see that's what i mean you paid a ransom so other people could now be set free to do it and i noticed when i was in grand junction you know and, and because i'm a leader and i know we're supposed to be focused on god but i still look around what you know just kind of look around once in a while and there was a guy on this side of me that kept getting more and more excited and finally, I was jumping up and down, and I just turned my head, and he was too, doing the same thing I was doing. <laughs> so see, I paid. Uh, now, I feel like, now I don't know if, I can't say God spoke to me, but I feel like I paid a ransom for him. I feel like if, if Kathy and I hadn't been there, he wouldn't have done that. He wouldn't have done that. Now, maybe I'm wrong, maybe he would have, but I just feel like he wouldn't have. And it's like you say, it gives them permission. Authority is permission to do those things, see. And it sets people free. And that's the attitude you have to have when you come in here. It doesn't matter whether Terry's leading or Brenda's leading or Bethel's leading or Cassie or anybody else, whoever's preaching, our job is to what? Pay a ransom. And we're going to try to draw out of them what God has for them. And unless you are part of that group, 
You know, Pastor Steve did a teaching the other day. He said, how many of you know that when they want to win you to the Lord, they'll say, do you know Jesus? You know, do you know Jesus? Do you know who Jesus? Do you know Jesus? And he taught this and he said, he said, it's not whether you know Jesus, it's does Jesus know you? Because what does the scripture say? I did not know you. You begin to knock on the door and I didn't know, I didn't know you. See? Because this is his body. And if you're not a part of the body, he doesn't know you. Because that's what he sees. That's what he knows. That's why I'm such big on church. Church attendance and belonging and being connected to a church. See, the foolishness, huh? Assembling together. See, the, most of the people out there think that that's foolishness. You know what I mean? And we can just be separate. Well, it's just me and God, you know. I'm just going to be, I'm going to get God on my own, you know. I'm my own church, you know. I, well, I am the body of Christ. No, not if you're not belonging and a part of the body. And you're interacting with it. You may be coming to get a sermon, you may be coming to get some music, but you're not a part of the body. And that's what he loves, that's what he died for, and that's what the city is, is going to be the body, not, not a bunch of isolated people. You see what I mean? So it's, it's, it's all about paying a ransom, and we need to pay, we need to, if, just like having the attitude, of, like we learned last week, of barrenness and desolation. It's an attitude. Does God want you barren? No. Does he want you desolate? No. It's the attitude that you have that you depend on him. And he wants you to pay a ransom. Why? Because he likes to see you suffer? No, because it sets people free. What? Sure you do. You get, like she said, like Brenda just said, you get joy out of it when you set people free. And why do you, why do you think you get joy out of it? Gee, when, where did that come from, you know? God, he's happy. Huh? Because God's happy, and if he lives in you, you'll be happy when people get set free. See, if God is not in you, you will be angry when people get set free. Have you anybody ever seen that? Yeah. yeah, they get angry. In other words, if you dare laugh in church or say anything funny in church, they get all upset about it. Why? They're because they're not free. Yeah. Oh, man. Go ahead. Oh, I thought you picked that up. Okay. Oh, Terry's got something. That's the difference between believing something and preaching to everybody else, but then actually doing it. Right. And I just wanted Kathy to say really fast, what's the deal about it's not enough to be John the Baptist in the wilderness? Can you say that? Because it fits so good. It's not enough to be John the Baptist prophesying the way of the Lord, but we have to become like Jesus and love the people enough to die for them. Yeah. Amen. Anybody else? Father, once again, we thank you for your word. You just uh, solidify it in us. Cause us to have this attitude. God, we're always going to be preaching this stuff here. It's always the same message, different words. And God, it's, it's simply that we must decrease and you must increase. And that's it. And so, Father, we thank you that whatever words we need, whatever words you want to speak, we will listen to. And as dawn comes... God, that whatever he speaks, whatever she speaks, whatever we speak, the end result will be the increase of government in our lives and their lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.